everybody welcome back to my channel this is Heidi from my reading life and I'm here today to start my sixth vlog for my August reading project which is to read 30 books in 30 days so it is August 24th Wednesday and I have completed another um, two books the first of which is another Penguin Green Ideas book. This is number 13, The Last Tree on Easter Island, um, written by Jared Diamond. And this is an excerpt from his book Collapse, which was published in 2006. So, um, and this excerpt is specifically about Easter Island and how um, current thinking, current science and archaeology have uh, theorized that the reason why the societies on Easter Island had collapsed was because they overused their environmental resources. So it's a really good cautionary tale for those of us living in the present day about how a group of people can really um, overuse natural resources and lead to societal collapse. So evidently Easter Island was a uh, one of the last places that was colonized as people moved from the Asian continent across Polynesia and it is quite distant from other land masses so it's sort of um, really far distant from both uh, South America and the next set of islands which is the um, what are those islands called there's a map I think pretty close here yes what were the Pitcairn Islands um, are like thousands of miles to the west and South America is thousands of miles to the east. And so it's quite isolated, uh, but it was colonized in that same wave of peoples coming from Asia across those islands in Polynesia. And then the groups of people that lived on Easter Island, because of the immense amount of resources that existed on that particular landmass, were able to form these competing societies and the reason why they think they built those huge statues, the Easter Island statues, was um, rival chiefs and rival communities competing with each other to see who could build the biggest statue, <laughs> which, you know, human nature, right? Um, and because they were so focused on, because to have an, an advanced society building huge um, artistic endeavors, such as those statues were, it required intensive agriculture and other natural resources extraction in order to do these artistic endeavors and that led to basically the destruction of the entire forest that existed on this island um, and there's archaeological evidence that like the largest palm tree in the world the largest palm tree species in the world probably existed on this island there were various other indigenous species of trees that existed on this island all wiped out due to human resource use so yeah um, really, really fascinating, really good to read as a cautionary tale for what's happening in the current day with natural resource use and makes me want to read the book Collapse. I did read Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. I've read that twice now, really enjoyed that book. Um, so I'm definitely going to keep my eye out for Collapse and read that one next. Uh, so this is book number 26 for the challenge, book number 27. I finished this morning on my morning walk, and that is an audiobook. She Come By It Natural by Sarah Smarsh, which is a look at Dolly Parton and um, how Dolly Parton does or does not embody feminism, and particularly feminism from the point of view of poor rural women. And it was fascinating. It was such a fascinating book. The audiobook is read by Sarah Smarsh herself. And I own the book as an ebook, but I decided to listen to it as an audiobook from Scribd because it fit better into my rotation. And I'm really glad that I did. The audiobook is, of course, when the author, a lots of times when an author reads their own work, it's, you know, it's a good experience because they know where to put the inflections and all that sort of things. And Sarah Smarsh in, includes a lot of information about her own personal life and her family and sort of juxtaposes that with Dolly Parton's life and how Dolly Parton handled different things in her life. Um, I'm a big fan of Dolly Parton, huge fan of Dolly Parton, particularly her imagination library and her work to um, spread literacy around, uh, around the world. I think she's just she is a uh, an icon and a just a person who has throughout her life 
chosen to do what works best for her and chosen to live her life in the way that she thinks is right in a way that I find really admirable. Um, and she has very famously uh, been quoted as not considering herself a feminist. And she probably isn't a feminist in the classical and traditional definition of the word, but she certainly has embodied um, the viewpoint of equality for women and the right of women to choose their own path and choose their own destinies. And I really admire that in her. She's an amazingly astute businesswoman uh, and has made some really excellent business choices throughout her life. She has dealt with unbelievable prejudice and sexism because you know, what everybody focuses on is her bodily attributes. And she uses that um, in order to forward her goals for her own life. And I admire, hey, you use the tools you have at hand. I've always said that her tools happen to be her body and she used them ruthlessly to get what she wanted in life. And she's just a nice person. Like she's just a good hearted person who tries to do to others what she would have done to herself. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't think she's I've always agreed with everything that she's done. There's been certain decisions that she's made over the course of her career that I would hope that I wouldn't choose to make, but I, I admire her um, forthrightness on what she has done. And I admire her, um, I, I admire the way that she sticks to her plan. Like she has a plan for how to uh, move forward with her life and she is stuck with it through 70 some odd years of life. Like she, she has a brand and she's sticking to it. So yeah, she had a brand before brands were cool. Anyway, really excellent book, really interesting, really informative in terms of thinking about how poor rural women might embody feminism in a different way than what, um, you know, sort of more, more upper class, more well-educated women might determine is feminism. I think there was one point where the author was talking about how Lots of times women who are in abusive relationships and who are very poor um, might be in a job where they're being um, harassed or, you know, put down or whatever, and they just leave. They just quit that job and leave. And, you know, that's seen as giving up and maybe not fighting for what you think is right in terms of equality. But sometimes the, the biggest the biggest and loudest noise you can make is simply to leave and to remove yourself from that situation um, and how it takes a lot of courage when you don't have any money or any other resources to leave that job because of sexism um, and how that's not... Um, that's not recognized as the courageous action that it is often enough. And I thought that was a really excellent point. And um, so, yeah, lots of things to make you think about feminism and how feminism works for different groups of people um, in the United States, particularly. Um, so, yeah, that's what I finished books 26 and 27. So, yeah, getting down to the wire here, but still have um, – six days to go in the month. And so I'm feeling really good about things and I will check in with you later. Good morning. It is August 
the 25th and I have completed two more books. Excuse the dog, he's making noises down here because I'm not paying attention to him. And uh, so yesterday, the 24th, I finished The Bookshop by Penelope Fitzgerald. And this was a real surprise to me. This book really was excellent. I really enjoyed this book. And it's very, um, it defies expectations is what I wanna say. So this is the story of Florence Green, who in 1959 decides to, uh, put everything that she has into opening a bookshop in her little town, her little seaside town in England. Now her husband died um, many years ago. Uh, he had gone away to be in the war and had died of pneumonia. And we don't really get any more details than that, but she's been living on her own as a widow in this little town for a long, long time. And she, uh, you know, before she got married, she had worked in the city in a bookshop. And so that is what she decides she wants to do. She wants to bring a bookshop to her little town. There is no bookshop in that town. And so as she tries to do this uh, entrepre entrepreneurial endeavor, she basically interacts with all the different quirky members of the town. It's very amusing. It's very British in its humor, but it's also got this under tinge of like, like there are some nasty people that live in this town and Florence has to deal with them. And they, some of the more powerful people in the little community have decided that they don't want this bookshop to happen in their town. And so Florence, you know, runs afoul of these powers that be and what's gonna happen to her and her bookshop. Um, just really amusing, really delightful and does not end the way that you expect it to. So for de defying my expectation, expectations I give this one very high marks really a joy to read a very quick read and I'm glad that I finally got this one off the physical TBR and then last night during my you know normal bout with insomnia I finished what I stand for is what I stand on by Wendell Berry which is the green ideas from the penguin collection number 14 Wendell Berry is very famous uh, environmentalist particularly having to do with agriculture and farming from Kentucky, I believe. Uh, yeah, K Kentucky. And he's been, you know, working on these issues since the mid 20th century. And this collection of essays spans writings that he did from like 1970 to almost the present day. Um, and he's talking a lot about how uh, our current economy is not conducive to humans living in harmony with the earth, that unless we address people's connection, particularly with agriculture and with natural resource use that were just, it's just not gonna end well. Um, and so that he is very, uh, he's very forceful in his beliefs, I guess is what I would say, but he's also a really elegant writer. So these are, you know, much of the same topics that have been dealt with in the other Green Ideas books that I've been reading. Um, are addressed in this book, but I will say the the main focus that Wendell Berry has is on uh, agriculture and a rural lifestyle and how local trying to do things more locally is is uh, the way to go. We should be trying to grow food locally, source food locally, use things that are made and produced closer to home, and that. Um, are sort of outsourcing all of our food production and our everything that we need production to unknown places far away has led to not only environmental degradation but degradation of of humans because of course if something's produced far away and you don't actually know the people that are producing it you don't concern yourself with the conditions under which they are working um, so yeah, really excellent. I had never read any Wendell Berry before, but I will definitely be wanting to try some more of his stuff um, because I thought he he hits a lot of points that I totally agree with. So definitely want to read more of his stuff. So that is number, this is book 28 and this is book 29. So only one more book to go. It's the 25th fifth today um my husband and i are headed out of town for an overnight uh, having to do with his work so um i'm not sure what i'll get done for reading but i will uh come back to you when i have finished another book <music>
Hello, it is August the 29th, and I have some exciting news to report. Yesterday, I finished my 30th book. Woohoo! It was this one, Facing the Mountain, A True Story of Japanese American Heroes in World War II by Daniel James Brown. I can't talk about it because it's my last book that I needed to read for the Book 2 Prize. But it's also book 30 for August. So I did it! Yay! And this is this was a chunker, so I feel... I feel accomplished. Um, and like I said, it's only the 29th, so I'm not going to end the vlog. I'm going to keep going because I have a couple of more books on the go. And I'll give a final update before I close out the vlog. I just wanted to report in because I have to return that book to the library. <laughs> because I had to get it through interlibrary loan and it's due back so it can go back to its home. So that's the update. I will check in again at the end of the month. Hey there, it's August 31st, and I want to close out my final uh, 30 books in 30 days reading vlog with the announcement that I reached my goal. Um, you knew that already, you knew that I reached my 30 books in 30 days, but I also read two more books yesterday uh, by the end of the day on the 30th. So I completed Upstream by Mary Oliver, which is essays. Um, and I have a whole book uh, where, I, I mean, I have a whole book. I have a whole video where I review this book that uh, was posted yesterday. So um, it's the author spotlight on Mary Oliver for Book Naturalist Book Club. So you can check out the review of this book there. But that was book number 31. And then finally, I completed a um, book that... W I blame entirely on Shelley Swearing Shelley Swearington, who talked about a book that she read for Garbagist, um, a fan fiction called All the All the Young Lords. And I will put the picture up here of it. And it is fan fiction written about the Harry Potter universe. And it is a story told from Remus Lupin's point of view and describes Remus's experiences throughout his time at Hogwarts with Harry's father, James, and his mother, Lily, and um, Sirius Black, and Peter uh, Pettigrew, and all of the crew that was the previous generation to Harry Potter. And um, it was very, very long, and you can only read it online um, from a website. And I started reading it and I could not stop. And so for at least uh, the last week or so of August, any moment I could, I was like squeezing in time to read All the Young Lords. And while it was, um, there were plot holes and things that uh, maybe didn't quite make sense, it was great fun to visit that universe again. Um, my problems with J.K. Rowling's politics and her personal um, uh not being nice on the internet aside, the world of Harry Potter is something that means a great deal to me. And uh, I really enjoyed my time spent in that world. I will say uh, the, the, the fan fiction is very long. It covers all, the entire seven years of Remus's time at Hogwarts and then his time after Hogwarts until um, the Harry Potter books start. So to the the present day in the Harry Potter universe. Um, so it's very, very long. And I think it is around 1800 pages. That's what is the, the information provided. Um, if you look on Goodreads, it says it's around that. So yeah, it's quite long. And I enjoyed the Hogwarts chapters or the Hogwarts, the Hogwarts books much more than I did the time afterwards, which was during the war and after the war and what Remus gets up to until he becomes, um, you know, he gets back into the storyline in the Harry Potter books. Uh, so yeah, it, it was a lot darker than the Harry Potter books, a lot more um, adult content, I would say, than the Harry Potter books. So just be aware of that. But it's a great deal of fun. Really glad that Shelley pointed me to them and that I read them and finished up my um, 30 books in 30 days reading with finishing that. So that's 32 books for the month. I mean, 32 books, guys. That is incredible. So page count wise, I'm just trying to get my stack here so I can hold it up and show you all the physical books that I read in the month of August. I hardly ever do this, but I have to show you. These are all the physical books I read. I also read a bunch of audiobooks and ebooks. So there's 23 books in this stack. These are all the physical books that I read. Um, and this plus the ebooks that I read uh, totaled 
4,430 pages. And then if you add that Harry Potter fan fiction on, um, which was about 1,800 pages, that's 6,229 pages total read um, for the month of August. So yes, I feel very accomplished. Um, and I am really glad that I did it. And I'm really glad that, that um, Britta got me excited about this idea and that I participated in it. But I have to tell you that I'm excited to pick up some longer books in September. I am a person that tends to read longer books more often than shorter books. And I do enjoy being stuck into a book for a longer period of time versus, you know, you know, chowing down through book after book after book, day after day after day. I mean, not that I didn't have fun doing this and really pleased with how many I read off my physical shelves. Um, that helps tremendously. But I do also really enjoy my long books. I'm really excited to get stuck back into some of those in the month of September. Um, but I have overall enjoyed this project and I found it very motivating and worthwhile to do. Um, I don't know if I would ever uh, be able to do it again because I don't know if I would have ever have this many more short books in my possession. Uh, and you really do need a lot of short books uh, on your TBR in order to be able to complete 30 books in 30 days, I think. I mean, I just, I work full time, so I don't have time to just sit and read like a 350 page novel every day, um, sadly. I mean, if anybody wants to like donate to the cause, I would gladly become independently wealthy and do that. But uh, in my current status, that's just not gonna work. Anyway, this has been a great project. Really had a lot of fun doing it. Um, really uh, wanna send out my thanks to Britta for being a cheerleader and for giving me great tips for how to conduct this type of uh, project and really was helpful to me. And I hope that I have encouraged some of you to try to take on a challenge like this, even if you don't try to do 30 books in 30 days, if you wanna try 10 books in 30 days or 20 books in 30 days, whatever is like a stretch goal for you in terms of your reading. I think it is a great way to motivate yourself and get yourself excited about reading and to, you know, just knock some books off your TBR, which is something I know we're always trying to do. I've had a lot of fun doing this project and I um, am glad to have done, uh, completed my goal of reading 30 books in 30 days. I hope you're all doing well and finding some great books to read and I will talk to you later.